The next speaker is Lynn Hendler. Lynn is a lawyer and she is an expert in disability um, and the disability process specifically for patients with congenital heart disease. Hi, my name is Lynn Hendler. I'm an attorney for JP Law. We're in Portland, Oregon, but the law is federal, so it applies to every jurisdiction. And I personally have a congenital heart disease, so hopefully that gives me some special insight. Um, and if you have any questions, you can also email me thereafter. Uh, so, Nationally, about 40% of individuals win their Social Security Disability Appeal, and that might sound like a really good number, but it's still important to have your medical records prepared because some ALJs or administrative law judges only give 2% of people their appeals. And the reason for that could be that they're only spending about one hour with their patients. Um, and looking over thousands of pages of medical records every day. And these ALJs telecommute, so you never know which ALJ you're going to get. I personally had an ALJ with an only 2% grant rate, and she was from Alaska, but she was telecommuting to Oregon. So you always have to be prepared and have your medical records really well prepared for these ALJs. And the question might be, should my patient apply for Social Security Disability? And the answer is yes, if they cannot perform a full-time job. And that is statutorily defined by whether or not they make $14,640, it's pretty specific, per year. And that's if they're unable to engage in substantial, gainful activity, and if they have a severe impairment that can result in death, or if it's going to last at least 12 months. And it must be diagnosed by a physician, and that might sound like a give me, but sometimes if you're looking back at their medical records, you'll see that their severe impairment was diagnosed by a therapist or even a nurse practitioner, and that's not good enough. It has to be diagnosed by a physician. So if you're looking back and you see that their severe impairment was diagnosed by a therapist, you should do the diagnostics yourself. So there are several steps when an ALJ is going through the medical records and diagnosing whether or not your patient is going to make social security disability. And the first one that they look at is if your patient can be fast-tracked to getting approved under a medical listing criteria, and that is also diagnosed and uh, under the Code of Federal Regulations, and I kind of condensed them into the, uh, into the slides, but you can also Google them, which I think is important if you're going to look through your patient records and see if, you're, if your patient meets them. So you should look at the uh, Code of Fe Federal Regulations, and it's a uh, Cardiovascular system listings 4.00, and there are several. And there are common problems that I encounter with uh, patients and their medical records. And one is that the required time wasn't shown, which is 12 months, and that could be that your lab work was done through intervals where it showed that your patient only had maybe their illness for three months, or the physician didn't know that the medical listings required certain tests because not every physician knows what's in the medical listings. And also that the longitudinal clinical record was insufficient. And that is often if the patient maybe didn't have insurance. And then also if the ALJ decided that the patient was ability, had the ability to perform routine chores or that the medicine was improving the patient, and so they felt that they didn't meet the medical listing. So here's one of the first ones, that's if they meet chronic heart failure, and you can see that it's really specific. And that's why it's important to Google the medical records and the medical listings. 
because it's, it's super specific. And I don't know if you want to spend some time there, but it, we can go on because it's, it's really specific and I think it's important to Google these when you encounter maybe a patient who has chronic heart failure. Recurrent arrhythmia is another one. And there's the congenital heart disease. And it's important to note that if your patient has a heart transplant coming up, they're only considered for a disability and only for one year. So that's pretty awful. And um, the next one is applicable if your patient has Marfan syndrome. And again, if your patient has um, the ability to perform routine chores, even, even if they meet these medical listings, they might not be able to be fast-tracked to disability because the ALJ will say, oh, I can see in the medical records that they are capable of daily activities or that their medication is giving them some improvement, so I am going to deny them uh, disability. And there are some practices that we can address here. And one is, like I said, ensure that your labs have intervals to document that they're meeting these medical listings for 12 months because it has to be continuous. And another thing that is important is that you can't just have the patient say that they're complaining of their symptoms for 12 months. It has to be objectively documented in the medical record. Um, another thing is as I noted, uh, a lot of doctors aren't aware of what the medical listings say, and so they will not order tests because they think perhaps it's redundant or a waste of resources. So I had this one case where there was a straight leg raising test that was required by the medical listing, both sitting and supine, and that probably sounded really redundant to the physician to order both. But because the physician did not order both, the patient didn't meet the medical listing. And so I argued that the patient should have met the medical listing because they failed the straight leg raising test, supine. So they should have probably met the medical listing. And I showed all these journal articles saying that you shouldn't order both and it's a waste. But because the physician didn't order both of them, she didn't make the medical listing argument. So that was ridiculous. And if you just had, if you just take the moment to see which tests are required, you can maybe order those tests, even, even if you personally wouldn't have done that because it's a waste of resources. And hopefully argue maybe even with insurance, because that could mean a world of difference for your patient. Um, Another best practice solution is uh, note that the activities of daily living that your patient is going through are accomplished with rest or difficulty. Because sometimes I see that in the medical records they will say that the patient is maybe planning to go on a vacation, that's really common. And the ALJ will say, hey, this patient was able to go to Disneyland, therefore they probably can perform a full-time job. And that's ridiculous uh, because it's an isolated vacation or often the ALJ will see in the medical records something really ludicrous, I hate to say, like that the patient is caretaking for a cat. And they will count that as an activity of daily living where they say, well, if you're able to take care of a cat or your, their child, that they can sit for eight hours straight and perform a job. So if you know that your patient is doing that with some difficulty, I know it takes, maybe take a minute of your time and write that down, that they're, they need to rest while they are cooking or they have to sit down while they're loading laundry. And, that would help, help your patient achieve social security disability a lot. 
And another thing that they use against your patient quite often is um, if you're trying a new medication, the ALJ might say, well, they said that they had some kind of improvement, but the patient never said how much they've improved. But the fact that your patient said to you, I'm feeling a little bit better, then the ALJ might say, uh, they said they're feeling a little bit better, so I think that perhaps uh, they might be able to perform a full-time job again. And again, the requirement is that they're able to perform a full-time job. And if the medical records uh, demonstrate that they can perform only a part-time job, that is what you have to emphasize. But if the ALJ can make some kind of a determination that the patient can perform a full-time job, even if they're just making some kind of educated guess, the ALJ will do that, and I hate to say that. But that is definitely has been my experience. So those are some best practice solutions for the problems that I've encountered that could maybe just be um, by you guys working just a little bit, just by documenting just a little bit, you can really help your patients out there. This is the last step. It's called the RFC, and you guys have probably filled out RFC forms for your patients. If the patient doesn't meet the listing, because again, they're really difficult to meet and they're highly specific, then the RFC is the last step. And the ALJ evaluates whether your patient has the residual functional capacity to see whether she has the ability to complete the mental and physical work activities on a sustained basis despite her impairments. And again, sustain means full time, not part time, even though the ALJ might want it to be part time. And um, the ALJ's analysis varies based on age, past education, and language ability and experience. An older individual with language barriers will be assumed to have a harder time adapting to a new position. And our job is to ensure that the client has the most restricted RFC possible. And I'm not sure how many of you have filled out an RFC form, but it's a check in the box form where you write how restricted someone is. And it's basically Yes, they have a lot of impairments that make them so that they cannot work well with other people or they have to take a lot of time off. Um, have you guys encountered that often? Okay, yeah. So you might not realize the problems that we get on our end when we turn those into the ALJs. So here are the common problems that we get. The common problem is that the ALJ decides your RFC form does not reflect your lab results or that they do not reflect your clinical observations, even though that was your patient, that you have dealt with for years, which is ridiculous, <laughs> but it's true. So what are some things that we can do? One is that, as you would hope, the law is on your side, that's your patient, and you're their treating provider. But there's an issue where if the ALJ decides that there's a conflict in the medical record, they have the ability to resolve that conflict. And that's what they will say. They will say, well, there was a conflict. These two things don't jive together. So I have the ultimate authority to make that decision and say mm -hmm. that this patient can work full time, and that's what they will decide. So it's important that you resolve that conflict and that you make those two things flow together, if, if that makes sense. So one thing you can do is explain the lab to RFC di discrepancies, and that can just take a second. Most physicians, I know you're very busy, you're not going to write down on the RFC your explanation, but it can be uh, it can make the whole difference. I had one patient who had severe arrhythmias, and so her lab results looked pretty normal. Uh, she had good O2 saturation and a normal ejection fraction, but her RFC said that she was very exhausted all the time and wouldn't make it to work 
all the time for obvious reasons that we know, but the ALJ didn't believe that. So she lost and we had to appeal. And so I had to send in lots of journal articles saying that, you know, atrial fibrillation <laughs> causes a lot of fatigue and the medication she was on, metropolol, causes a lot of fatigue, but that wasn't on her RFC. So I had to explain that, and she did win her appeal that way, but had that just been noted on her RFC, we might not have had to go the route of a massive appeal, and the uh, patient might have been able to get her benefits a lot sooner. So. If, if it, I know it just takes a second, but you guys are really busy and I understand that, but it, it could mean a world of difference for your patients. So I hope that kind of clears up this really murky world. It's not, it, it is very obscure and not something that you guys would ever want to delve into because it's not a lot of fun. So <laughs> I, I don't enjoy it either, <laughs> but I hope that that helped clear up some things. Um, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. If a patient is wants to be one disability, they have one of these diagnoses. Right. Otherwise, your objective self is pretty good. I mean, your heart function is normal. Their functional capacity is good. How does that get interpreted by the judges? Right. It is. Um, I guess it, it's kind of what I had just said that if they see the functional capacity is good, then they will say that they're. Uh, daily activities are, they have too, too much abilities to do their activities of daily living because it's, they should be fast track, but if they have too much ability to do activities of daily living, then they are not required to fast track it. So it doesn't that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's like the big problem. And that, that's why I, I kind of, or I tried to emphasize the activities of, of daily living and why it, it might be helpful to say when you're writing your medical records and you see that they have some kind of issues with their daily chores or even another thing that I noticed too when people are recommending, just recommending exercise to their to their patients, then the ALJs will say, well, hey, they're able to walk, you know, a quarter of a mile. That is the ability to walk and they should be able to do a full-time job. And that, that's not okay. So if you write down like, well, yeah, you can walk, but maybe rest when you need to, if you just add that little bit, it might help. That's true. That is very true. They won't even listen to it because that's uh, there. There's a statute that says that that's re reserved for the commissioner, so they won't even look at it. Did you have a question? It, it should be a physician. They will get really nitpicky about that. I, I've had what you said happen, and they will just, they will make that argument. Yeah. Can you both sign it? Yes. Yes. Actually, by statute, we can't charge. Uh, we get paid a, a set percent off the winnings, and it's capped. And all lawyers should have to do that? Yes. If we don't do that, it is illegal. <laughs> you can probably, or, uh, 
Yeah, report that person. <laughs> Yeah. That will be a discrepancy. Oh, a yeah. Discrepancy, I know. I know, isn't that ridiculous? And the judge will not have any clue what you're saying. It is ridiculous. Huh. Yeah. I mean, again, the judge has zero medical training, none. It is ridiculous. He has no clue what you're saying, and he's going, I mean, one patient alone can have medical records up to, and you know this, thousands and thousands of pages, and he, he's going through. 10 patients a day and he's just flipping through this as quickly as humanly possible and when he's looking at that he's like I don't know what this is and I'm not going to look it up. Yeah. So all he wants to know <laughs> is can this person work and even if I'm seeing that I don't really care because that's a judgment that is left to me alone so I'm going to make this judgment based on the one hour I'm spending with this person. It is actually kind of ludicrous, and I hate to say that about my own. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs>